Well, we're back, we're back here with Elspeth, and she's now going to inform us a little bit about this man named Hagerty or O. Hagerty and how that happened and some of his family and uh, his history with the uh, rebellions in Ireland and his job and how he came about to collect these 25,000 volumes of books and uh, how they ended up in Lawrence, Kansas, a very fitting place, but surprising, and uh, what people around the country might think. Uh, Elspeth, take it from there and tell us about O'Hagerty and his collection. Yeah, well, O'Hagerty was born in Cork, but actually his parents had immigrated to um, the United States and had actually lived in the United States uh, for a while. And his father had been a Fenian <laughs> um, in the U.S. Uh, when they had lived here. But they decided, his parents decided to move back to Ireland to start their family. And so now, they did. Uh, I, one question. I just thought there's a lot of people who might not know what a Fenian is. Oh, so this was uh, an organization sort of, um, they're the Fenians sort of in the United States and then the Irish Republican Brotherhood um, in Ireland, and they were uh, an oath-bound organization um, essentially devoted to uh, an independent republic of Ireland. Um, so they were working to overcome British rule in Ireland, um, sometimes by violent means. And in fact, the Fenians did have, uh, some of them were involved in a dynamite campaign um, in the 19th century. So there, there, you know, uh, there are lots of sort of interesting things there. And so there was this political element to um, O'Hegarty's early life in the influence of his father. However, his father was not the major influence in his life, in part because his father took ill very early in O'Hegarty's life, um, came down with tuberculosis, um, and was essentially in a poorhouse infirmary, um, and then subsequently died. Um, so before O'Hegarty, you know, grew to be very old while he was still young. Um, and so, what, what county? Do you know what county that was in the early days? Uh, where O'Hegarty was? He was in yeah. Cork. Cork, so, okay. Yeah, he was in uh, Carrignaver, Cork. Um, and so his mother actually was the person who sort of pulled things together, um, sold her wedding ring, uh, advertised for work in the local paper when her husband went off to the sort of poorhouse infirmary and kept the family going, um, made it so that uh, P.S. Uh, Patrick <laughs> Sarsfield and um, his brother uh, Sean John, um, who also went by Jack, um, could have a life for themselves. And so uh, O'Hegarty was educated by the Christian brothers um, and sort of decided, though, fairly early on that he was agnostic. Uh, <clears throat> he grew up, took uh, a great interest in the Irish language, um, and so became involved in the Gaelic League, actually later taught for the Gaelic League, um, and he entered civil service. Uh, he worked briefly as a law clerk, um, and then he entered civil service in the post office, and um, working first in Cork, and then transferred to London. Um, around a little after the turn of the century. And it was really in London that he became um, particularly active um, in uh, political circles. Um, he had sort of been interested and active in that beforehand, um, but he <laughs> sort of, uh, people hit upon him as a person who could sort of take a leadership role. And that's where he became um, one of, a member of the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Um, during his time in London, and was a part of um, Republican and nationalist, Irish nationalist circles in London. Um, and there he met uh, Michael Collins and knew him um, and others, um, including uh, his good friend Bulmer Hobson um, and those that he worked with. Uh, and so that was an important time for a Hegarty. He was also writing for a lot of sort of the mosquito press um, uh, nationalists, publications how, how that were old, sort of how old would he have been around this this time are you talking uh so he was he was born in 79 so this time the earliest part of that he was there um he would have just been you know 20s and sort of onward he was in london through 1913 right. and then in 1913 he went back to cork and was in the post office in cove there 
Uh, and then, and then, oops, and then the war came. Was that to start of his postal fame? So no, his postal career started first in Cork and then he went to London and it was actually because, um, Ireland then was part of the United Kingdom. Um, if you were to advance in civil service, uh, oftentimes you would go to England and that actually the sort of head of, um, the post office for the United Kingdom was in London. That was sort of the central branch, um, then. So that's where his postal work took him. Uh, and he always throughout his life spoke very positively of the British civil service and thought that it was actually sort of in the free state period and, um, and then moving into the Republic, um, that it was really a model (laughs) that, uh, that Ireland should adopt. He, I think he came away from the postal service and, and from, um, our, the British civil service quite impressed with how the organization of that structure, even if there were times um, in which he disagreed with some of the things that were happening within there. And certainly um, he and his brother um, both sort of were transferred or attempted to be transferred at various points in time because of their nationalist um, leanings. And so, as I said, he came back uh, in 1913 to Cork and was in the post office, continuing in the post office there, but then with the outbreak of World War One, because he had been known for his political writings um, in these periodicals, uh, was transferred um, first to Shrewsbury uh, and then to Welsh Pool in Wales. And he spent the sort of duration of the war out of the country. Um, and that transfer was almost certainly for political reasons. And he sp- spent time in uh, Wales. Yes, yeah. So he was in Welsh Pool in Wales. I tell you, a lot, of, a lot, a lot of books in Wales. It's like the country, one country full of bookstores. It's just amazing. Yeah. So maybe that whetted his appetite a little. I don't know. Well, actually, his passion for collecting um, really began, well, I think he probably had a passion for books for a fairly long time, but he really began collecting um, while he was in London. Um, so in 1902, he sort of gets there, um, and I think his collecting really ramped up um, while he was in London. And uh, I had mentioned he, after <laughs> after the war, um, uh, the United Kingdom required uh, an oath of allegiance of civil servants, um, and O'Hagerty refused to take this oath to the crown and instead uh, returned to... Ireland um, and actually ended up working as a manager for the Irish bookshop in Dublin, which was on Dawson Street. Um, And that bookshop was particularly known for the strength of its Irish language holdings. And so um, he also (laughs) took a turn at being a bookseller as well as a collector at that point in time. Um, And then after the Anglo-Irish War um, is when he became um, in sort of recognition of all the work that he had done in the Postal Service, um, became uh, Secretary of Irish Posts and Telegraphs. Uh, And so sort of, uh, you know, the closest equivalent here would be, you know, Postmaster General. Um, So sort of took on that, uh, uh, you know, administrative role within the new Postal Service. And what regime was this under? What, like, what year? What, what was the politics? Yeah, of the day? so this is sort of starting in the Free State period, um, and so his career in the post office spans sort of the Free State period um, into the sort of Constitution of Ireland, um, and he retired in 1945. Um, so that's when he finished his postal career. <laughs> and now, did he have all the books collected by then? He had many, many books by then, and actually, in this picture, you'll see here. Um, this is a picture of his study. I'll tip it up so that maybe you can see um, that where you have the bookshelves end, he has piled books on top, and so that they really reach up to the tip of the ceiling there. And, and so this, this is his this, study. This is his house yes, inside his, his house in the study. It didn't didn't have his wife even had some things to say about that. Uh, well, <laughs> he you know was always collecting books, and actually the reason that the materials ended up here. Um, was because after an illness, uh, O'Hagerty was trying to think about um, how he could provide for his wife, who was 10 years his junior. Um, He had his pension, but he didn't think it was going to be sufficient. And he thought, well, where in what I have is there some sort of monetary value? And he thought, well, his books 
for what had monetary value. And he realized that there had been parts of his collections that he had collected that he did not think of as particularly valuable at the time because of varying literary tastes. And um, But where he saw some of the value of his collection was uh, initially in his literary holdings. And so he talked about his Henry James collection um, and his Yeats collection. And those are the two that he ended up in conversation with the University of Kansas about um, selling. And he had <clears throat> originally contacted John Carter, who was uh, had been in the book trade um, and then was uh, working uh, in the British Foreign Office, and he asked if he knew of anyone who might be interested. Carter got in touch with someone at Columbia um, and someone at UCLA, and then sort of through those connections um, ended up uh, sort of the deans of libraries here the um, uh, at KU, those who were in charge, sort of heard about this collection through um, someone who had been previously at UCLA. And they jumped at the opportunity. They had, um, not too far before that, acquired a James Joyce collection from a Chicago attorney and book collector, James Spurry. And so you sort of had that connection of modern Irish literature there. And so following that, um, collecting, you know, and an modern Irish poet seemed to have great appeal. And so they uh, contracted through a bookseller um, and Pickering and Chatto and then uh, imported um, the Yeats collection. And then it was <laughs> uh, after O'Hegarty's death. Unfortunately, they went and sent pictures of themselves unpacking the Yeats materials to O'Hegarty and his widow wrote back that um, unfortunately, he didn't get to see those pictures before he died. Um, but they had asked, the librarians here at KU had asked O'Hegarty to send him, or to send them pictures of himself so that one day, you know, there could be a picture in the library and so that people could see whose collection yes. this was. And yes. um, O'Hegarty really liked the idea that, you know, a student might wander by at some point and say, I wonder who that old fellow is. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and, and Wilhelmina sort of told that story to uh to the librarians as she was writing a letter after a Hegarty's death. Here, pull that pull that photograph there back a little so I can see so we can see it. It's down a little low. Yes, I think I and, <laughs> breathed uh, on it and knocked oh, it over here. We've got. Okay. Um, so you'll see O'Hegarty there sitting in his library, and he's holding up a W. B. Yeats volume. And again, um, Yeats was a great collecting passion of his. And O'Hegarty was really someone who collected books, not just to collect them, um, but because he was generally interested in them. He was a voracious reader. Um, he was also a voracious writer. And I'll, I can say a little bit more about his writings, um, but he was particularly interested in Yeats's writing. Um, and so I think it's fitting to have this picture of him there sitting with uh, a volume, a Yeats volume. What about the O before his name? Oh, so that is something that O'Hegarty uh, did add himself. So his father was Hegarty. Um, and so P.S. added the O. <laughs> I, Which anciently the O would have been there. And right. No doubt. And if you're studying the Irish language and you had pride in the Gaelic League, you would be, people started adding the O and the Mac back onto the names. Yeah. And so um, O'Hegarty also wrote uh, several books of history. He was not trained as a historian, um, but took a great interest in historical matters. And so he wrote um, a book on uh, titled The Victory of Sinn Féin, and he wrote a memoir of his uh, childhood friend, Terence McSweeney, um, the Lord Mayor of Cork, who uh, died on a hunger strike. Um, and then he wrote uh, several other books um, uh, and ultimately, after he retired <laughs> from the post office, uh, published A History of Ireland Under the Union, um, which is sort of a popular history that uh, was uh, read by many in Ireland. Yes, just now. Now, where are we at on his book? Have you got all the books over here now in our narrative? Where did we leave off? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, we, we had mentioned his retirement. So after his retirement is when he published that study, A History of Ireland, um, under the Union, and uh, and he actually dedicated it to his friends, uh, Bulmer Hobson and Robert Lind. Um, and 
uh, sort of with a thought to the history that they themselves had lived through um, and the importance of recording history. Um, and O'Haggerty had also written in the Sunday Independent in 1946 an article urging the public to consider recording their memories of the lived history that they had experienced. He definitely thought because of you know, political schisms and because of biases that they themselves would not be able to write the history of the period from sort of um, the Dublin lockout, so from 1913 or even from, um, you know, after Parnell's death onward through uh, 1923, um, that they wouldn't be able to do that objectively, but that future historians who would be able to look at it a little... Uh, with less emotion um, and um, with less uh, personal investment, that they would need the accounts of people who had lived through that time in order to do that work. Um, and so he encouraged the public to um, participate in what initially started as um, a university-based project and then later took, got taken up by the Irish government to record witness statements of individuals who had um, participated in sort of 1913 through, um, I think, 21 is when they sort of cut off that particular project. Um, but uh, to, again, record that history, I think, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember now, and I hope I won't misremember it, but the title of his article might have been um, Getting Our History Put Straight. Yes, um, yes, no, well put. <laughs> so, and, and so... Um, you see sort of that outreach to the public in terms of recording history, but you also see it represented in his own collecting. And as I said, because of um, his various political connections and because of his deep knowledge of Irish history, he was an even better collector and he would go around to used bookstores um, and write to booksellers all over um, to acquire materials and later in his life, um, actually, as he was serving as Secretary of Irish Posts, um, often acted as a cultural critic, too, and would publish um, sort of more broader general cultural interest uh, articles um, and um, would write things about bibliography uh, and uh, sort of books themselves as part of that work, too. And uh, I didn't point out when we were in the exhibition space, but we do have in the exhibition there a volume um, that is a first edition of Virginia Woolf's Jacob's Room. Um, and that particular copy, and we have it open to the speech where um, Jacob sort of very briefly contemplates Irish home rule and sort of amusing as he's uh, sort of as he's musing, sort of that's one thing that his mind sort of strikes upon. Um, but were you to open it to the front of that volume, in the volume you would see um, the book plate of Lily Yates, who was, uh, you know, her, her given name was Susan, but she went by Lily, who was one of Yates's, um, the poet W.B. Yates's sisters. And um, <clears throat> P.S. O. Haggerty had actually acquired a number of volumes from y the Yates family library after the deaths of Lily and his other sister, Lolly. Um, Yates's widow, George, Georgie had um, dispersed, you know, sort of duplicates or had weeded um, Yates' sister's libraries when they died and distributed them among a few booksellers, I think Hodges and Figgis and uh, Greens in Dublin. And so Yates sort of fished these out of um, the used booksellers, uh, secondhand booksellers' stores um, and added them to his collection. And there is, uh, originally you might have thought, <laughs> there is a familial collection, uh, connection between O'Haggerty and Yeats, um, but it was actually one that sort of came quite a bit later, um, about 10 years after Yeats dies, and di Yeats um, dies in 1939. But 10 years after that, uh, P.S. O'Haggerty's daughter, Grania, um, marries Yeats' son, Michael. Um, so actually the Yates family and the O'Haggerty family were joined. <laughs> yeah, that's a good combination. What about uh, uh, O'Haggerty's uh, brother? So O'Haggerty's brother, um, Sean, uh, and I had mentioned before, Sean was also in the post office at one point um, and then was during the war, they attempted to transfer him and he sort of ended up leaving the postal service as a result of that. Um, but Sean actually became an IRA leader 
during uh, the War of Independence, the Anglo-Irish War, um, and <laughs> is sometimes sort of um, held responsible for a number of the killings that took place. Uh, I th those are sometimes attributed to him, or I believe they are attributed to him. Um, and so there was a real difference between the brothers and sort of the tactics that they saw as um, being fruitful for achieving independence, Irish independence. Um, P.S. O'Hegarty allowed some arms to be stored in the bookstore um, where he was, uh, that he was managing during the Anglo-Irish War, um, but he became very wary of violence, and he was particularly wary um, during the Civil War period of uh, the civilian casualties um, and the effects of violence on civilians um, and non-combatants. So, uh, you know, he and his brother had a difference of opinion um, on that matter. And he knew, you said he knew Michael Collins? Yes, yes. Yeah. So he did know Michael Collins from um, his days in London. And again, um, I think there was another difference of opinion about just how much force was needed. This is, you know, even during the um, War of Independence, you know, when force should be used. Um, and then, of course, uh, during uh, the Civil War in which Michael Collins was killed. Um, though, like Collins, uh, P.S. O'Hegarty was on the pro-treaty uh, side. Um, <clears throat> but again, very uh, wary of the way that um, schisms emerged in um, the nationalist movement um, and the violence that sort of became a part of that. Hey, how about uh, uh, on his mother's side? Was she Irish, French, Dutch? Yes. So uh, his mother was also um, Irish. I think. Uh, <laughs> was it Hall Remember this? Hallinan. Hallinan was yeah. uh, her her maiden name. Um, yes. And so uh, again, he sort of has that interesting story though that his parents had um, immigrated to uh, the United States and then came back. And so it's interesting in some ways that his collection ended up coming to the United States, where here it can be an amazing resource for research and scholarship into the history of Ireland. Well, and you said, I remember I had, uh, I've got an old set of the Annals of Ireland by the Four Masters. It's big, big volumes before they were broken down into the common set today with, with seven volumes in it, I think. And I thought, well, boy, there's just, I've never seen it before. This has instructions for rebinding the four big volumes into the little set, littler seven volumes. And I thought there's, uh, it just couldn't be anything. And I, I, I've tried to impress you. And I said, well, I've got this because you had everything else. <laughs> and he said, no, we've got it too. Well, I, that, you know, I think that's where, and that's why a collection like this is really valuable to students and scholars is that there is a depth of material um, that allows them to really dig into a particular subject. So it's not just that there's political material, but that there is also genealogical material. There is also local history. There is also ephemeral materials like those political pamphlets or ticket stubs, um, that there are manuscripts like the, um, uh, I don't know that we spent time looking at it, but um, Imer Ardefi, a writer, um, wrote uh, an account of, it's sort of an autobiographical account, um, Romana Clef, a little, Romana Clay, a little bit, um, called The Wasted Island, in which he depicts um, some of the re leaders of the 1916 Rising that he knew. And we have in that display case um, some of the pages from his revision. He wrote it, and it was published, I believe, in 1919 and then revised it in 1929. And so we actually have the drafts from his 1929 revision there. So there are literary materials um, as well. And I think it's um, the complementary nature of all these materials um, and the sort of various aspects of political, cultural, daily life um, that they document um, that makes them such a rich resource. And didn't you have a, a, a live, uh, like James Joyce coming back on a train or something, and he had, he had made notes on <laughs> next, next to his band work or something, and you've got the original piece of paper that he wrote on? Yeah, so that's uh, actually, and again, you know, uh, our Irish collections really have a number of strengths. I mentioned before that we have that um, 
James Joyce collection. And so in that, um, sort of combining some materials that are in P.S. O'Hegarty's collection with materials there, um, you can lie one next to each other um, an announcement um, from the publisher Monsell, um, Irish publisher, um, for the projected publication of James Joyce's Dubliners, you know, as it appears as an advertisement in an Abbey Theatre program, um, right? And this is in 1910, and they're saying, out in September. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that was not to be. <laughs> um, so the uh, what was to be the Irish edition published by Monsell that was to come out of Dubliners um, was postponed and there were concerns about what Joyce was writing, sort of censorship concerns, um, that he was naming real people, the way that he was depicting Ireland. Um, And so in in the end, it ended up being destroyed at the printers. Um, And Joyce wrote this satirical poem called Gas from a Burner um, that is written from the perspective of a printer who destroys a work that um, impugns Ireland's um, good, sort of good name. (laughs) Um, And so it's sort of a satirical take at um, a version of nationalism that sort of interferes in aesthetic matters. Um, uh, But at the bottom of that, Joyce has inscribed it in his hand, um, sort of telling the circumstances under which that poem was written, um, and sort of about the destruction of that, what was to have been the first edition of Dubliners. And then you can lay that back to next to the edition of Dubliners that finally does get printed by Grant Richards in London. Yes, and boy, what an eye to save something like that. <clears throat> they just, uh, what a comparison. Uh, now, how about, <clears throat> we see all those books in the room, and how did he collect them? How did he get them? He bought uh, some, but didn't. Wasn't some of them like on the rounds when books couldn't be delivered, or? Yeah, so I mean, he would write to booksellers. So he wasn't limited to working with booksellers in Dublin. He would write to booksellers all over. Um, he'd see things advertised in catalogs. He'd ask after them. He'd send bibliographic queries out to people that he might think you know, that he thought might have some particular volume. And so he would acquire books by post. Um, And actually he had the pockets of his jackets altered um, so that he could make space for some books in his coat pockets um, so that he could have his hands (laughs) free as he went about. And he often cycled around Dublin um, so that as he cycled about Dublin, he could still have a book or two or three with him. Can you imagine all the people saying, who's that old guy? What's he doing now? He's putting all these books in his coat. Coat? Is he going home and selling them, or what's the? I mean, they 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 would have thought he was eccentric. Yes, and and um, you know another thing that O'Hegarty was known for, especially in his youth, was keeping sort of rather crazy hours, and he would cram all of his postal service and civil service work into a couple of hours, and then so that the rest of his time he could devote to all of his meetings, things related to the Gaelic Leagues, things related to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, his meetings with various people, his writings that he was doing. Um, He had so much on that he sort of would sleep very little and then cram everything else into that busy day. And so um, the energy that it must have taken to do all the things that he was doing at that time period um, is really sort of astounding. <laughs> uh, what about, how does this collection compare? What, what do other libraries think? I mean, uh, I don't know the politics of how people get what and who chooses what they got, but are people surprised you ended up with this? or? Yeah, I think people are sort of constantly surprised that, you know, again, that this is here in Kansas. I, I, people, you know, when they think about Irish materials, they think, oh, Boston, right, as Mm -hmm. an important um, location for Irish American culture, or, you know, maybe they'd think of Chicago or other places. Um, But, uh, but yeah, I think some people are surprised um, to discover this material here. And uh, I had the chance recently to go to the uh, American Conference uh, for Irish studies and talk with fellow special collections librarians at Notre Dame, um, at Boston College, um, at Queens in Belfast, and, and think through ideas about our collections across collections and um, ideas that are concerns for collecting Irish materials in libraries generally. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So that was a really wonderful experience. And it's also wonderful to see what scholars are working on currently in Irish studies. And so it was always great to go to talks there and then be able to speak to someone after the talk and say, did you know that we actually have letters related to this particular thing yes. at the University yes. of Kansas? Um, so I gave out a few cards to people and said, oh, you should come. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <research> here. <laughs> that's, that's real. That's really interesting. And it did. It, it, of course, you know, a lot of Irish immigrated to Missouri and Kansas and settled, so it's fitting. It's just most people don't know. Yeah. They, they hear their word. I first heard about it, and so I thought, man, this is amazing. They have like 10,000 books, even though it's 25. So I called up, and they said, well, we, we really are, we're not prepared. I guess they were just sitting in boxes for years. Oh, well, I think maybe, I think when we first met, they had already all been cataloged. There was a big cataloging project that had taken place, but... Um, this was before, a little oh, bit before this was that. before. But okay. I came down here, I said, well, I'm going to get in there and see yeah. this collection. I can't, you know, they have posters, they've got everything in the world. And so we go into this building where it was housed and upstairs, the elevator, and they said, well, I'm sorry, we don't have, uh, you know, it's not cataloged. We don't know, we don't know what we have exactly. And, uh, but they were nice enough to pull out a few things just to let us look. And then we waited and waited, and then you must have been the determining factor of getting it all organized. Oh, no, no. I, I will say they had the collections here, uh, and when you suddenly acquire 25,000 items, yes, <laughs> yes, that does put a certain burden on a, you know <laughs> libraries like us. We usually have relatively small staffs, and so it was more than the library was able to absorb into its daily cataloging. Um, however, because of the importance of the collection and its strength, they were able to, um, I think it was in the early 1990s, get uh, an uh, NEH-funded grant, um, three-year grant to process the collection and to get it cataloged. Um, so there have been uh, records um, in the library's catalog since then. And so I think it was in the early 1990s yeah, that be they cataloged yeah. um, all the materials. And it's been really a wonderful resource since then. And what year and was it acquired? It was first acquired in 59. 59, Yeah, my and gosh. so parts of it had been cataloged um, before then a long way, and people knew of the collection and came right. and used it. But, you know, the sort of more detailed cataloging, actually, as part of that project, a lot of the cataloging then was original cataloging for, especially for these rare and ephemeral items, no one had ever created a catalog record for that particular yes, item before. Yes, it didn't before. exist. What a, so, what, a, what a fun thing that would be. Yes, so um, that has been great. And we do, we really do get queries um, from all over regarding these Irish materials. So from Ireland, um, you know, from all over in the United States, from wherever scholars are studying Irish materials. And I think sometimes the other thing that takes people by surprise when they hear that we have Irish collections here at the University of Kansas, they sometimes think, oh, they're Irish American collections. Yes. And actually I think people are sometimes a little bit disappointed to learn that we actually don't have that much Irish American material. We have some things, mm -hmm. but because this was a collection that PSO Haggerty was building in Ireland, um, and because his interests were um, Irish history and Irish politics and Irish literature, the focus was really on Ireland um, rather than the Irish American experience. Uh, when you say you've got an Irish library here, it's true. It's 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 really it's it's the Irish heritage. It's an Irish library moved to Lawrence. Yes, yeah. it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and what about the online status? Uh, so all of the books you should be able to find. Um, cataloged if you've ever used WorldCat, um, which is sort of a union catalog um, that multiple institutions around the world sort of put their holdings in. So you can find our materials there. You can look for them in KU Libraries online catalog. And um, I have created a library guide for our Irish collections um, that is gives you advice on searching for materials um, and also lists out uh, some of the Irish manuscript materials. Is that um, online? Yes, yeah, that is Good. online. And so. if they want to find it, what do they do? Type in your name or? Uh, oh gosh, uh, I can. I will send you the link. I believe okay. it's uh, guides.lib.ku.edu forward slash Irish. But I could be misremembering it, so <laughs> I'm going to. I will put I'm it on the. Send you the link. <laughs> I'll get it on the video. I'll put it in a little caption down there. Okay, we'll, great. We'll have it for sure. Uh, any other any other thoughts in general? 
Um, no, I just, if there are, you know, people listening to this who are interested in conducting research with Irish materials, I hope that they'll know that these materials are here uh, for them to use. Um, can, and they, can they call up just to say, hey, what do I do? Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, we are definitely accustomed to having visitors come who've never visited a special collections library before and had never conducted research in that environment. And it is a little bit of a different environment yeah. um, than you know, your regular public library or, you know, KU circulating collections where you just walk into the stacks and pull a book off the shelf. Right. Um, and the reason that we have different conditions here is because um, we sort of have this dual purpose. Um, the first is to sort of acquire these original research materials um, and provide access to them. So enable people to use them. Um, but because we want people to use them today, but also a hundred years from yes, today, yes. Um, their preservation is very important to us as well. Um, so we have a reading room where we only allow pencils because heaven forbid there would be an ink <laughs> an exactly. explosion accident and yes. something might happen to this item of which there are only three copies you know, in the world or for a manuscript item, which is the only copy, yes, yes. a unique item. Um, so those, so there are you know, a few things like that or we'll ask you to put um, books in a special cradle to read so that as you're reading them, they'll be sort of firmly supported and um, it won't be putting pressure on the binding. Yes. Or um, people ask sometimes, do you have to wear gloves to handle the materials? And the answer is generally no. The only exception, and you saw me with, me, with my gloves here, um, is when handling uh, photographs. And that's just because <clears throat> the oils from your skin can damage the emulsive surface. Yes, over time. Of the print. Mm. Yes, so so we ask you to wear gloves for photographs, but otherwise we adhere to the Library of Congress guidelines, which say it's actually better if you're turning a page for you to be able to tell when you're putting pressure on <laughs> yes, you know, a page yes. that may be brittle. Um, so, but again, don't be put off by any of these special circumstances. Again, they're just there to preserve the materials. Um, and our staff are aware that you may not be familiar with these things. So we're happy to give you guidance on how to handle books um, and to walk you through the process of using a library like the Spencer Research Library. And your, your special display is going to be here till the end of July in yes. 2016. Yes. And for people watching this in 2018, It'll, it, they'll be here still, and you can still access the library. It's just it won't, the special display yeah, the won't be out. the exhibition won't be there. Um, Although you've had two special exhibitions, haven't you? Or little special displays. Well, and we've had a variety over, over the years. Um, since I've been here, this is the first... Irish collections exhibition that we've had since I've been here, but I've only been here for five years. And they're, okay. you know, in the long past of the history of the library, they've done a number of Irish related exhibitions. Yes, um, so yes. it is an, a topic of interest and in, in part, again, because of the strength of the collections. Um, but our exhibitions usually switch out three times a year. So if you're just interested in the kinds of materials that we have here generally, and we have a wide variety of collections. Yeah, you see, you um, had some a really ex extraordinary uh, science fiction. Science fiction fiction collections, um, a lot of great Kansas history materials, um, materials related to the University of Kansas, um, and then within special collections, lots of materials related to early printed books, related to 18th century British and French materials, um, Central American materials. Um, so we actually have a very strong collection of Guatemalan materials from the 19th century. Um, you know, so a post-World War II poetry. So there are a variety of areas of specialty that we have. Um, and uh, we'll have an exhibition, the next exhibition that I'll be there, which will begin, I believe, in September, um, is an exhibition called In the Shadow of Cortez. And so um, we'll be looking at that and we'll be sort of using materials from our collections here, um, as well as materials from a traveling exhibition. Boy, that's pretty good. I know you you have gone several places for travel and exhibition, and that's good. So keep your eyes open. If you see KU, University of Kansas, Special Collections, O'Hegarty Collection, is that the right sub? Yeah, sub yeah. So yeah, through? yeah. You'll see. Yeah, uh, Kenneth kind of Spencer Research Library uh, at KU Libraries, University of Kansas. Okay, I guess. Oh, I should probably. I'll sign off. Just get in front of the camera. <laughs> yes. Once I hate to be totally upstage. I won't. I'll just Come. say.
oh, I don't see anything. I don't know what I'm doing now. I think uh, if you uh, sit there, you'll be on screen. Thanks very <laughs> much for watching this. Uh, uh, the KU people are great, and this collection is amazing. If you have any interest at all, check it out before your, uh, before your time runs out. And Elspeth, I'd like to thank you very much again. And uh, uh, we'll have some credits at the end. If you want to credit anything else, we'll take care of that. And uh, uh, so I don't want you. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure.